we celebrate this weekend and tomorrow grew out of laborers' desires to be valued for the work that they did, to have it be valued beyond their jobs and beyond their lines of work. The history of Labor Day, according to the United States Department of Labor and uh, featured in Homiletics Magazine this month, traces back to a demonstration by the Central Labor Union on Tuesday, September 5, 1882, 134 years ago tomorrow. Uh, and this New York City trade union organized a parade, some might have called it a march, from City Hall to Reservoir Park in Union Square. And at the park there were picnics, speeches calling for uh, an eight-hour day. At the time, at this particular time, an average work week for a full-time manufacturing employee was 100 hours. 100 hours a week. A typical schedule would have been about 14 hours a day, seven days per week. So you can imagine working from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, at night, that doesn't leave much time for anything else. Congress passed legislation creating Labor Day in 1894, and however, it would take uh, years before the speeches made in Reservoir Park in 1882 to bear fruit. The eight-hour workday and the 40-hour work week did not become the standard that we know today until 1940, 1940. And yet many of us still struggle to find a balance between our work and the rest of our lives. Even as we celebrate Labor Day, we, who now are living in a sort of electron, not sort of, we're living in an electronic age, are tempted when we're away, I can attest to this, to peeking at email or to checking on Facebook to see if we haven't missed anything important. It's called FOMO. Have you heard the acronym FOMO? Anyone heard it? It's been out for a couple of years, F-O-M-O. It de describes how people feel when they give in to their gadgets and they allow themselves to feel the need to be overly informed and concerned about being in the loop. FOMO means fear of missing out. <laughs> we want to believe our lives are more than what we do, and yet our inability to disengage from our jobs tells a different story. So, thank you all. We had a lovely vacation. Carl and I were up in the Canadian Rockies. It was absolutely great. You, you, you can't lift your camera without flora and fauna just getting in the way of your lens. It's so beautiful. We met up with a tour company that got us out onto some glaciers. It's remarkable. And even a, a glass shelf that, that sticks out from a canyon so that you could walk out on glass and look down to be. I, I torture Carl every year with some high space he has to walk out on. <laughs> so we were warned that we might not have phone or internet service for uh, a couple of days, and indeed, we didn't. We can't do this anymore very easily now that we're so wired in. I found myself having the need to take my phone out of my pocket and just, oh, I don't know, hold it, turn it over. <laughs> I noticed, though, I, I thought, I wonder if anyone else is doing this. And I turned around on the coach that we were on. I didn't know anyone. We just joined this, this tour they give. And people also had them out tapping on tiny little impotent keyboards. I don't know what they were doing. They had become nothing more than electronic teddy bears, placebos for Apple product junkies. We could not disengage, we could not. Tomorrow is a day set aside for us to rest, to disengage, to relax, and recharge for the work that is ahead. The reading you heard today, you don't hear very often, because it's not a part of our Protestant Bible. It remains in the Catholic Bible as Sirach or Ecclesiasticus. It was removed sometime around the uh, formation of the King James Bible. It was written by a philosopher named Jesus, not to be too confusing. Uh, and Jesus wrote it a couple of centuries before the Jesus that we follow was born. And in this chapter, it extols the sense of pride that people take in their work 
and in the place of importance everyone has in the making of a healthy city. All these rely on their hands, and all are skillful in their own work. And without them, no city can be inhabited, and wherever they live, they will not go hungry. The Jesus who wrote these words, and the Jesus we followed, showed concern through both word and action, respectively, that wherever workers would reside, they would be treated fairly. In our history, our church tradition has been in partnership with the labor movement, and this movement would go on to experience gains as well as dignity in workers' comp, health insurance, vacation time, disability, sick days, and so on. And although the church was sometimes on the sidelines and even in some cases opposed workers' rights, the social gospel movement, a movement of which we uh, know very well, affirmed the intersection of faith and social ethics and played a major role in securing justice for working people. Bruce Everly is a UCC pastor and theologian on Cape Cod, and he writes, Labor Day is more than symbolic. It reflects the prophetic concern for justice for the hard-working poor and vulnerable. The prophetic writings, he says, and the gospel message consistently affirm the rights of laborers and the dispossessed. Economics matters in the biblical tradition. What people eat and where they live is as spiritual as well as an economic and political issue. Disparity of income and power is a recurring biblical concern. The widows, the landless persons, and unemployed people matter to God, just as God heard the cries of the oppressed Israelites, then God hears the cries of the poor. He says Jesus' ministry embraced the rich and poor alike, alike but his most controversial acts involved his inclusion of outsiders, people at the margins of the religious and social and economic worlds, as members of the realm of God, deserving care in this life as well as in the next. And with the growing disparity between the wealthy and the middle class, not to mention the poor, in the United States, Labor Day is an opportunity for the church to give thanks and to recognize the importance of those who stand up for workers as well as embrace the larger implications of this holiday. And it's not merely a matter of class struggle, but the recognition of God's shalom, God's peace, in which poverty and wealth are ultimately a matter of spiritual stewardship rather than private ownership. The scriptures do not use, uh, do not oppose property, ownership, or wealth, but see them as part of God's care for the whole earth. The earth is God's. The economy is a matter of justice, and care for the vulnerable is a moral and a spiritual requirement. <coughs> what about our own work? How do you feel about your own work, what you're doing right now at this time? Studs Terkel wrote a book in 1972 eventually became a musical with James Taylor. It's called Working, and in it, Turkle describes the search for a level of meaning in one's life, of meaning that people working at any level try to find, a sense of meaning that transcends the actual monetary compensation they may receive for it. It's a search, Turkle writes, for daily meaning as well as daily bread, for recognition as well as for cash, for astonishment as well as torpor, in short, for a sort of life rather than a Monday through Friday sort of dying. Turkle then goes on to describe the failure of most people to find that meaning, that life, in or from their daily work. 
on this Labor Day weekend, can you find in it what it is that you do now? Student, starting out, mid-career, winding down, retired, fully employed, or searching a sense of engagement with your community that makes you still want to bring the best skills you have to this, your corner of the world. Where are you in your own labor? We all want to know that we have a purpose and that we are useful. We tend to define our lives by what we do, and that's a whole other subject. We tend to define our lives by what we accomplish and what we achieve. Think on it. Tomorrow is Labor Day, and tomorrow night as you open up those boxes and gently slide those white shoes in them for another year, <laughs> it's an opportunity to think about what brings value to our lives. Are we contributing? or allowing life to pass us by? Are we engaged? Are we in idle? Do we feel that we are of full use? This is an open table. Bring all of yourselves to this table. Whoever you are and wherever you are on your journey, you are welcome at this table. <laughs>